I would like to address, at least in part, why Jesus had to suffer so. And I'll begin with a section from John Stott's book, um, The Cross of Christ. We must now pass by the details of the betrayal and arrest of Jesus, his trials before Annas and Caiaphas, Herod and Pilate, Peter's denials, the cruel mockery by priests and soldiers, the spitting and the scourging and the hysteria of the mob who demanded his death. We move on to the end of the story, condemned to death by crucifixion. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before their shears is silent, so did he not open his mouth. Carrying his own cross until Simon of Cyrene was compelled to carry it for him, he will have walked along the Via Dolorosa out of the city to Golgotha, the place of the skull. Here they crucified him. The evangelist write, declining to dwell on the stripping, the clumsy hammering home of the nails or the wrenching of his limbs as the cross was hoisted and dropped into its place. Even the excruciating pain could not silence his repeated entreaties. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The soldiers gambled for his clothes. Some women stood afar off. The crowd remained a while to watch. Jesus commended his mother to John's care and John to hers. He spoke words of kingly assurance to the penitent, criminal, crucified at his side. And meanwhile, the rulers sneered at him, shouting, He saved others, but he can't save himself. Their words spoken as an insult were the literal truth. He could not save himself and others simultaneously. He chose to sacrifice himself in order to save the world. Gradually, the crowd thinned out, their curiosity glutted. At last, silence fell, and darkness came. Darkness, perhaps, because no eye should see, and silence, because no tongue could tell. The anguish of soul, which the sinless Savior now endured. Here's the question. Why did Jesus have to suffer so? By now, you know, most of us understand the need for a sacrifice, in order to appease God's wrath. But why did it have to be such an agonizing death? For we are not talking just about physical pain, but emotional and spiritual pain. There is not a complete answer, but we can say some things that partly answer the question. And here's the first answer. As a substitute, Jesus would have to suffer all we would otherwise have to suffer. I'll say it again. As our substitute, Jesus would have to suffer all we would otherwise have to suffer. Now I'll explain. In other words, if Jesus was our substitute, and he was, then he had to suffer everything we would suffer if we were to die in unbelief and be separated from God. He suffered the agony of what we would have suffered Dying in our sins. Now first, let's just talk about his need to suffer physical death. We will talk about the spiritual part in a little bit, but let's focus for right now on physical death because it is a part of sin. The requirement for a priest in in Hebrews 5 is that he uh, be able to identify with those who he represented. So it was necessary for Jesus to die a physical death, which is one result of the fall. And you say, well, how does that apply to you and me? Here's how it does relate. When a person is dying and finds himself or herself praying, he or she can know that God through Christ has suffered this and cares deeply for him in that moment. Moreover, he will carry us through that moment. The real connecting point between God and us is the incarnation. God became a man. uh, We can visualize him. And God identifies with us in every way. I watched a good friend die. And I wondered what the last hour or so was like for her. She must have been praying with this great sense of comfort, knowing Jesus had been through this and was then uh, there for her. 
How could she choose to quit living? Because I think that's what kind of happens. Knowing she would be with the Father, as was Jesus. This does not apply just to death. It applies in all the ways of life. Jesus fully identifies with us in everything. But there's another thing that Jesus suffered. As awful as Jesus' death was, it did not hurt him as much as spiritual suffering that he went through. There was darkness that came over the land for about three hours. What did the darkness symbolize? Well, Jesus called hell outer darkness. To be separated from God was to be uh, was called darkness. And while Jesus hung on the cross, he suffered being alone from God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And in that separation, we can say that he bore the darkness of hell. We can say, therefore, that our sins sent Jesus to hell. Now, there's a little controversy over the Apostles' Creed and whether it literally went to hell, but we got to say this. Not the... Uh, he surely experienced what hell is all about. That is why he felt forsaken of God. We might wonder how Jesus could die alone since, you know, he is one with the Father. It's a paradox. It's a paradox. But who can explain the Trinity and the mysteries of God? We just accept them as, the faith, as faith, uh, uh, by faith and the faith of children. This much we know. Jesus suffered as a substitute to identify with everything the judgment of God would bring. That is, bring on us so that through faith we are now exempt from that judgment. There's another reason Jesus suffered so, and that is he had to show us certain things or teach us certain things. And the first thing he taught us about was the seriousness of sin. Sin must be a very serious matter if God had to go to such lengths, that is, the offering of his son. If sin was not such a grave issue, then would, it have been a, would there have been a need for such a gruesome sight? Since we live in a world of sin and with our own sin day to day, you know, we don't really think about the seriousness of it. But it is. And it required the bloody sacrifice of Jesus to solve the problem. Now, just the opposite. In his suffering, he showed us also, secondly, the extent of God's love. Stott says it takes a hard heart to remain unmoved by a love like that. Let me read to you from Romans 5. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps... For a good man, someone would dare even die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I don't go out of my way to, um, uh, for my enemies. Do you? <laughs> you know, sometimes you bump into each other and you have to be nice to one another, but I don't go out of my way for my enemies. But God did. But God did. That's what it's all about. Third thing he teaches us, salvation had to be free. Under the circumstances, men could never achieve salvation or be good enough to earn it, it had to be accomplished by God alone and then given to those who would believe. So why did Jesus suffer so? To be a substitute who could fully identify with those he came to save and to reveal how serious the thing sin is, how great God's love is for us and that the only way to salvation uh, uh, is uh, by faith uh, I'm sorry, that salvation is a free gift by grace through faith. Well, let's pray and then we'll participate in the Lord's Supper together. Father, thank you for the reminder and help us to think and to think your ways, for those are good ways. And we pray in Jesus, amen.